In this video, we'll go over some rules that are either misunderstood or just kind of niche and don't come up very often, so it's really easy to get them wrong. And at number 10, we'll start off with something light, and that is the calculation for maximum fall damage. You see, when you fall in D&D, you take 1d6 bludgeoning damage for every 10 feet that you fall, and you fall 500 feet a turn. So if you fall off a cliff that's 500 feet high, the maximum fall damage you can take is 20d6, as fall damage caps out at 200 feet. And the thing that's commonly misunderstood about this is the cap for fall damage. As in some games I've played in and even some videos I've seen on D&D, I've heard the fall damage maximum was said to be 100 feet for only 10 d6 bludgeoning damage. And then when I was double checking the maximum fall damage for an encounter with a rock that I was setting up, where I had planned on it pulling players to the maximum amount in order to drop them for fall damage, I was surprised to learn that it's actually 200 feet and not 100. Although, I'm not exactly sure how often people misunderstand this rule, which is why it's only the number 10 spot. And at number 9, we have Silvered Weapons. There are some creatures and monsters that are resistant or immune to all weapon damage, except by the damage from weapons that are magical or silvered. And according to the DMG, you can pay a blacksmith 100 gold to silver any weapon of your choice, just in case you run into a monster which is immune to non-magical attacks, and you're in a low magic item campaign. Like werewolves, which are just straight up immune to non-magic attacks that aren't silvered. Or if you have lots of devils, like the ice devil for example, which is resistant to all non-magical attacks that aren't silvered. So it seems like just paying 100 gold to silver one of your weapons would make you set for the rest of the campaign. However, because there are a lot of common creatures that make an exception for silvered weapons, it's commonly misunderstood that silvered weapons basically count as magical weapons. So if you're fighting a creature like a vampire who is resistant to non-magical weapons, then a silvered weapon doesn't actually deal full damage against them. Which is kind of ironic because silver is one of the weaknesses of vampires in some forms of vampire fiction. But unless the creature specifically says that a silvered weapon can bypass their resistances or immunities, then silvered weapons just act like normal non-magical weapons. And at number 8, we have ranged attack rolls in melee. If you're performing an action that requires a ranged attack roll, with something like a longbow or just a cantrip like Firebolt, then if you attack a creature who's within melee range of you and 5 feet, you have disadvantage on that attack roll. However, this disadvantage actually occurs if you have any hostile target that's within 5 feet of you, no matter what your actual target is. So if you're trying to hit a creature that's 100 feet away from you with a Firebolt, and you have an unfriendly creature within 5 feet of you, then you have disadvantage on that attack roll. And the commonly misunderstood rule here is that most people believe the disadvantage only comes if you're trying to attack someone in melee range with a ranged attack. So if you primarily use ranged attacks, you really want to make sure nothing is nearby at all times, unless you have the crossbow expert feat, which allows you to attack with the ranged attack rolls with no disadvantage, even if you have someone within 5 feet, and even if it's not a crossbow attack. And at number 7, we have Concentration and Spellcasting. This one is a ruling that I've heard from some people online that commonly messes up newer players. And the misunderstanding here is that while concentrating on a spell, you can't cast other spells. Which is not true. If you're concentrating on a spell, as long as you have actions available, you can cast whatever other spell you want. The only problem is, if you try to cast a spell that requires concentration while you already have concentration, in which case the previous concentration will simply drop immediately and you'll be able to use a new spell no problem. And casting other non-concentration spells while you're concentrating on a spell doesn't actually cancel the concentration. And also a reminder on how concentration breaks from damage. If you take any amount of damage while concentrating on a spell, then you have to succeed a DC 10 constitution saving throw or else you lose that concentration. And if the damage is higher than 20, that might increase the DC of the saving throw as the DC is 10 or half the damage you took, whichever is higher. Most of the cases though, the DC is just 10, but if you're getting hit really hard as a spellcaster taking more than 20 damage, then eventually half damage will exceed 10 and you'll have harder saving throws. Which is good to know if you're trying to break the concentration of a boss monster. And also, you have to take a constitution saving throw for each instance of damage. So if you hit a boss with a magic missiles that hits three times, then that's three concentration saving throws. And at number six, we have identifying magic items. The misunderstanding. In order to identify a magic item, you must use the first level spell, Identify. The actual rule? You can identify a magic item over a short rest. The Identify spell is simply the fastest way to reveal an item's properties, not the only way to know what a magic item does. 
However, there is a variant rule for more difficult identification, which basically states that you need to use the identify spell in order to know the properties of a magic item. This is another one where I didn't actually know the ruling of this one for the longest time, and always assumed you needed to use identify in order to know what a magic item did. I'm not sure how common this ruling is messed up, but it's definitely one I thought I would include in this video, as the way I've been doing it nearly my entire D&D career is basically just a variant rule to make it harder and not the default one. And at number five, we have spells cast from magic items. The misunderstanding. Casting a spell from an item counts as the item casting the spell. The actual ruling is that any item which casts a spell basically treats it as if you cast the spell, and the item simply gives you the ability to use that spell. Unless the item specifically states otherwise, like some legendary or artifact weapons that specifically say they hold concentration on certain spells and not you. So if you're using a magic item like the Brazier of Command Fire Elementals, where basically all it does is allow you to cast Conjure Elemental, then you have to keep concentration on that spell, and it's not in fact kept by the item. Again, unless the item specifically says it does, like the legendary item Black Razor, which can cast the haste spell on you once per day and mentions in its text that it's able to maintain concentration so you don't have to. And this also means the downsides of spells apply to you as well. Like if you use a luck blade in order to cast the wish spell for something that's not an 8th level or lower spell. However, if you simply give the item to someone who can't cast spells anyway, then it's not really a big deal if they can never use wish again. So having an item with wish on it is still very valuable as long as you pass it around to everyone to use all of its charges on unconventional wishes if you get multiple wishes. And at number 4 we have advantage and disadvantage stacking. The misunderstanding. Having multiple instances of advantage will override one instance of disadvantage and allow you to have advantage on your attack roll. The actual ruling is that if you have multiple instances of advantage and disadvantage they just cancel each other out and the roll is done like normal. Which also means if for some reason you have advantage in like five different ways but one singular way of getting disadvantage then it completely negates all of it and the attack, skill check, or saving throw is done with a normal roll. Because no matter how many instances of advantage you stack on top of it, just one instance of disadvantage will completely cancel everything out, as they don't stack. So it doesn't matter if you have multiple instances, which also means if you have a whole bunch of disadvantage for whatever reason, maybe you're trying to shoot a ranged weapon attack with the target in melee range and you're poisoned, just as long as you have one instance of advantage, it cancels it out and it's a normal attack roll. Normally, getting advantage and disadvantage is kind of difficult, but if you employ the variant flanking rule, then advantage comes up a lot more often than normal, and this is definitely a good rule to be aware of, especially for classes which can't use their features if they have disadvantage, like how sneak attack just cannot be used at all if you have disadvantage on the attack roll. And at number three, we have the surprise round. The misunderstanding. You sneak up on a group of enemies and they don't notice you, and you initiate combat. You get a full round to attack them while they can't do anything until the second round. The actual ruling is that there's no such thing as a surprise round, and just the surprise-like condition, which is just called surprise. However, the way surprise works is very similar to what a surprise round sounds like, just with a few differences. The way surprise actually works is when you initiate combat with an enemy group, you first check to see if the creatures are surprised or not which is determined if one group is hidden and performs stealth checks, and the other group has passive perceptions that are lower than the stealth rolls of the people who are trying to sneak up on them. Then you roll initiative, and if the creature is surprised during their turn in combat, then they can't take any actions or move until the end of their turn, after which they're no longer considered surprise, which means almost nothing until their next turn, other than the fact that they can now use their reactions, where previously their reactions were not usable until their surprise-like condition was lifted. And since they lose surprise as soon as their turn ends, that means if you're playing a creature or class which requires a target to be surprised in order to gain advantages, like a doppelganger or an assassination rogue, that does mean you need to beat the target in the initiative roll in order to gain those benefits or those features. So if you're playing one of those two things and you go last in the initiative order, then you won't actually be able to use any of your special features which heavily incentivizes them wanting to have high initiative rolls, like taking the alert feat, which gives you a plus five to your initiative. And also, a few other things to note. If your entire group is trying to sneak up on someone and one of your party members has just a really terrible stealth roll, 
then it's possible for them to alert everyone and completely ruin that surprise condition. Because if a creature notices just a single threat at the start of combat, then they don't have that surprise-like condition. Additionally, some creatures of a group can be surprised and some creatures might not be, as it's not an all-or-nothing situation. So if you're trying to ambush a group of bandits and they have a couple of creatures which have very high passive perceptions, they might not be surprised while everyone else is. And also, if the creature is not surprised, they can't use their turn to alert everyone else to danger so that it removes their surprise. And at number two, we have natural 20s. The misunderstanding. You're trying to convince a king to hand over his kingdom and roll a natural 20 on your persuasion roll so you succeed and become the new king. The actual ruling is that rolling a natural 24 skill check or saving throw doesn't guarantee a success or failure. However, rolling a natural 24 in an attack roll or a death saving throw does have some special features. Where rolling a 20 in an attack roll means you'll always hit and perform a critical strike even if your attack is lower than the target's AC. And rolling a 20 on a death saving throw will get you back up automatically and is only worth mentioning because it's technically a saving throw, whereas none of the other saving throws have this feature. So if you're trying to save from an ancient red dragon's fire breath and the DC is higher than what you can possibly roll in your dexterity, then there's no possible way for you to succeed even if you roll a 20 and you just take the full damage. Or if you're trying to convince a king to give over his kingdom and you roll a natural 20 for your persuasion roll, then maybe the king will just laugh off your attempts and not call the guards. But you do not automatically get a successful outcome. You just might fail less if your DM is generous. Since there are things in the game which guarantee a success if you do roll a natural 20, it makes sense why this rule is commonly misunderstood. It might possibly be one of the most misunderstood rulings in the game. However, I've also seen tons of people who know that it's so commonly misunderstood that they actually know the real ruling of it, so I only have the number two spot on this list. Basically, because it's so commonly misunderstood, it kind of goes full circle and actually isn't that misunderstood anymore, which is not really the case with number one on this list. And at number one, the most commonly misunderstood rule that I see all the time is bonus action spellcasting. The misunderstanding. You're playing a cleric and you want to heal two of your party members who went down in your previous turn. So you use your bonus action to cast healing ward on one of them, and then you run up to another party member and use your action to cast Cure Wounds. The misunderstanding. If you use your bonus action to cast any spell, then you're not allowed to cast any other spell for the rest of the turn unless it is a cantrip that requires one action to cast. However, this ruling is often misunderstood even further, where people who know this ruling commonly mistake it to assume no spells can be cast two times in one turn. So let's set up a situation. You're trying to cast a fireball, but an enemy spellcaster is trying to counterspell it in order to stop your fireball. So what you do is cast counterspell to counterspell your opponent's counterspell, and that way your fireball succeeds in casting. The misunderstanding would be that you're not allowed to cast two spells in one turn, which is actually not the case. That previous example works perfectly fine. The ruling with not being able to cast any other spells for the rest of the turn is only applied if you use your bonus action to cast a spell, and that's it. As long as your bonus action was not used to cast any spells, then you're free to use as many spells as you want in your turn, assuming you have ways to use additional spells in your turn. Like if you're an Eldritch Knight who uses Action Surge in order to cast two spells in one turn, using two actions. Or if you're trying to counter spell while casting a spell, since Counterspell uses your reaction and not your bonus action, nor action. And this does also include sorcerers who convert a normal spell into a bonus action with metamagic, which will lock them into only cantrips for their action. So a sorcerer can't bonus action a fireball and then use an action for a fireball. They would have to use their action on a cantrip instead. So this ruling is commonly misunderstood in two ways. First off, newer players will usually misunderstand being able to cast other leveled spells after using a bonus action spell. And more advanced players will misunderstand the ruling on not being able to cast two times in one turn, because of the specifics of the bonus action spellcasting rule. So just as long as your bonus action is not used to cast a spell, then you're kind of good to go. At the end of my last video on commonly misunderstood rules, I asked if there were any other rules I should talk about and I got a ton of suggestions. So in this video, I'll be going over a lot of commonly complicated rulings, as well as just some other misunderstood ones. And at number 10, let's go over the rules for jumping. Jumping is a type of movement that is rarely used from what I've seen. So it's pretty easy to see why people don't understand the intricacies of jumping, or even know the rules on how to perform a jump in the first place. So 
When it comes to jumping, there's two kinds. There's the long jump and the high jump. In order to perform either of them, you have to first run 10 feet before you do the jump. Then there's different rules depending on if you're trying to jump upwards or side to side. If you're performing the long jump, then how far you travel is equal exactly to your strength score. And performing a high jump is equal to your strength modifier plus 3. So, if you have a strength score of 10, then you can long jump 10 feet. Which is pretty helpful if you're trying to jump over a small little pit that's probably 5 feet wide. However, if your strength score is only 10, that means you have a 0 to your strength modifier, which means you can only high jump 3 feet. So, if you were trying to jump up 10 feet in order to get to a ledge, you might not be able to do that, but there are extra rules where if you're performing a high jump, that you can actually reach something that's 1.5 times your height plus the distance you jump with the high jump, factoring in extending your arms above your head. So, if there was a ledge that was 10 feet high, your character is 6 feet tall exactly, and they only have 10 strength, then as long as you get a 10 foot running start, you'll be able to reach an area that's 12 feet high. Since you get 3 feet from the high jump, 6 feet from your height, and then an additional 3 feet from half of your height. And if you're trying to perform a long jump or high jump without running 10 feet first, then all you do is cut the jumping values in half. So if you have 10 strength and you're trying to perform a long jump, you can jump 5 feet without running first or 1.5 feet with a high jump. And any feet that you jump is counted towards the amount of movement you have for the turn. So if you run 10 feet and then jump 10 feet with a long jump, then you've used up 20 feet of your movement for that turn, and only have 10 feet of movement left. Now, where jumping gets confusing is when you involve magic items and spells that increase your jumping distance. Take the first level spell Jump, for example. This spell simply triples a creature's jump distance for one minute. So if the character has a strength score of 10, that means they can do a long jump of up to 30 feet. However, the average character only has 30 feet of movement, and you need to run at least 10 feet first, otherwise the jump distance is halved. So, if you have the ability to jump 30 feet, and you get your 10 foot running start, how many feet are you able to jump if you only have 20 feet of movement left? The answer is 20 feet. Even though you have the ability to jump 30 feet, you only have 20 feet of movement left. The way to really take advantage of spells like jump is to take the dash action to increase your movement speed for the turn. So the character with 30 feet of movement speed took the dash action, then they could easily jump for 30 feet and get that 10 foot head start since they'll have 60 feet of movement for that turn. So even if a character has the ability to jump extra feet because of some kind of magic item or spell, doesn't mean they get extra movement speed to allow you to jump that extra amount of feet. Although I have seen a lot of very common house rules to just let characters who use the jump spell do that anyway, even if it's not technically rules as written. Although Sage Advice did clarify you can't jump further than your movement, it's just commonly house rule to allow people to jump super far if they get magic things that let them jump farther and unrestrain them from their movement restrictions. And at number 9, let's go over the Rogue Class Ability Sneak Attack, as it's definitely something that's misunderstood a lot from a lot of online D&D stories I've read mainly about playing with terrible DMs who nerf the ability because they don't know how it works. Sneak attacks for Rogue is one of their class features, which just adds a whole bunch of extra damage to one attack that they perform, since they're one of the few melee-centric classes that does not have the extra attack action. So, sneak attack is there to kind of balance them out. And how sneak attack works is if you attack something with a finesse or ranged weapon, and you have advantage on that attack, then you do an extra 1d6 damage to that creature, which increases with the rogue's level. However, you can also trigger sneak attack if you simply have an ally that's within 5 feet of that target who isn't incapacitated, and you do not have disadvantage on the attack roll. So those are the two ways you can proc sneak attack, by either having advantage on the attack, or just having an ally near the target, but you do not need both. There are additional ways to proc sneak attack with certain rogue subclasses, but that's the baseline. You can also only proc sneak attack a single time per turn but not per round. So if you get an opportunity attack and hit something and meet all the conditions for sneak attack, you also get sneak attack on that attack, just as long as that's happening outside of a turn in which you've already used sneak attack. This also allows you to use items like the scimitar of speed to turn your reaction into another sneak attack by just using the ready action ability to form a trigger where you attack outside of your turn. Now, the way I see a lot of people getting sneak attack wrong is by simply adding extra layers to how sneak attack can function. 
A very common thing I see is people treating sneak attack very literally and only allowing a rogue to get sneak attack if they're hidden or they've got surprise on the enemy, which kind of makes sneak attack useless if you're only able to maybe get it once per combat, when actually it's balanced around being usable once per turn. So if the DM tries to homebrew some way to make sneak attack more true to its name, it's probably a good idea to tell them that sneak attack is just a flavorful way for rogues to deal their extra damage and doesn't actually require them to be hidden in any way to use it. And at number eight, we have the complexities of the ready action. One of the standard actions you can take on your turn is called ready, and it's actually pretty versatile in what it allows you to do, but is often a pretty underused action, so it's easily misunderstood with some of the specifics that come up involving it. Where, when you take the ready action, basically what you do is describe some kind of action that your character takes that can happen outside of your turn, just as long as it happens after a predetermined trigger. So, if all enemies are hiding behind a tree, for example, you could create a ready action in order to shoot one of them as soon as they come out. That way you don't waste your turn doing nothing. However, there's some rules to what you can and can't do with a ready action, where you can only choose to perform one action or move up to your movement speed with that trigger, but not both. And using the ready action will take up your reaction, which means you can't do things like opportunity attacks or counter spell. And also, if you decide to ready a spell, you have to concentrate on that spell even if the spell normally does not have a concentration requirement. So it's possible to completely lose the spell if your concentration is broken before the trigger occurs. Now, the only thing that's probably misunderstood about the ready action is the fact that it creates a concentration requirement for spells you're about to cast. But other than that, it's pretty straightforward and is really loose in what you can actually do with it. Basically, if you can do something with your action or movement, but not both, you can do that with your ready action outside of your turn using your reaction. And at number seven, we have the rules and confusions regarding mounted combat. Mounted combat has a lot of confusing parts about it, even if the rules about them are pretty simple. If you're mounting a creature and you're directly controlling the creature, then both of you act on the same initiative. The mount can only take the dash, disengage, and dodge actions, and it has its own movement, which you're able to control without any actions on your part. So just think of it like directing your mount as a whole bunch of free actions. And then you also get your own movement and actions, and it costs half your movement to get on your mount or to get off of it, but you can only get on or off once per turn. Now, where the confusion of a mount comes in is in the nitty gritty specifics of controlling your mount. A lot of people incorrectly assume the mount can attack because the mount can attack if it's independent. There are separate rules for controlling an independent mount and a controlled mount, where an independent mount just kind of has its own turn and does whatever it wants, which allows it to attack. And if you ride it, you have no control over what it does, but still gain advantages of being mounted if you have any, like the mounted combatant feat. However, controlled mounts cannot attack, and it has some extra rules to remember for the actions it is able to take. If it takes the disengage action, for example, it provides the benefits to its rider as well, since the rider is technically not moving, and you're just going along for the ride. However, if the mount takes the dodge action, you do not gain the same benefits as the mount, because it only affects the one specific creature, and a target can choose to attack either you or the mount. So it is kind of confusing that disengage works on both of you, but dodge doesn't. Also, while you and the mount both move on the same turn in initiative, you both have separate turns nonetheless. You just get to pick whoever goes first during each round. So what you can't do is charge in with your mount and then attack, then have your mount perform the disengage action to run away, because that would mean your mount had ended its turn to allow you to start your turn to start attacking, and no longer is able to move as its turn is over for the round. So if you're already in range to attack while you're on a mount, you can attack first and then command your mount to run away, but then you won't be able to do anything else since your turn has ended after you start commanding your mount, which kind of makes navigating a mount pretty terrible, as one of the main benefits of the mount would be the maneuverability of attacking and then getting out of range with its disengage action. There's also extra rules for staying on the mount if it would get pushed back, which are kind of similar to maintaining concentration, but instead of a constitution saving throw, you just do a dexterity saving throw instead with a DC of 10, in order to stay mounted. And at number six, we have the invisibility condition and how it functions. If a creature is invisible, you can still attack them and even hit them with AOE attacks. This was something that came up a lot in the comments where people asked to clarify how invisibility works because I remember getting the wrong when I first started playing the game as well. Invisibility doesn't make their location unknown by default. It just counts them as heavily obscured and grants them a couple of combat bonuses. 
which does mean the creature can perform a stealth check in order to hide themselves without having to be behind cover, since the invisibility condition grants them those benefits already. As it's still possible to hear or smell where they are, or just the other environmental things that might give away the location, like footprints in the snow. Which means invisibility still requires you to hide, and is not a god mode that allows you to do whatever you want without anyone being able to notice your presence. It does allow you to take the hide action anywhere, since you're constantly heavily obscured. But you do have to take the hide action if you want to hide your location from your enemies. And you do need to perform stealth checks if you're trying to sneak past people, even if you're invisible. And if you're in combat with an invisible target, thankfully this means you can attack them just at disadvantage, and as long as they're not currently under the hide action and hidden from you. And what this means is there's no trying to guess what square they're in if they're not hidden by the hide action, as your character knows exactly where they're at and can aim their attacks appropriately, even though they can't see them. Although they still can't use abilities which specifically require you to target a creature that you can see, like a lot of single target spells, since they are technically invisible even if they know their general location. So, even though invisibility doesn't give you god mode invisibility like in video games, it is still an excellent condition because it gives you advantages on all of your attacks while invisible, and all attacks have disadvantage against you, even if they know where you're at. And at number 5, we'll go over what can and cannot be counterspelled. Counterspell is a pretty simple third level spell, which simply reads, as a reaction, in response to seeing a creature within 60 feet of you casting a spell, you can interrupt the casting of that spell and cause it to fail with no effect. But if the spell is a fourth level or higher, then you have to make an ability check to see if your counterspell succeeds, unless you cast a counterspell at a higher level spell slot. Now, the confusions of counterspell comes in a whole bunch of extraneous circumstances that might allow you to avoid a counterspell. Say, for example, you're casting a spell through a wand, like the Wand of Magic Missiles. The magic item itself is providing the components of the spell, but allows the creature using the wand to cast a spell as if they're the ones using it. And in the example of someone casting a spell through a magic item, you can actually counterspell it, since you can see a creature casting a spell, no matter the actual source of that spell. Even if all the components themselves are covered by the item, there is also more confusion when it comes to casting a spell from a spell scroll, as the scroll itself provides all the components of the spell, which means you don't need to use a verbal or somatic component. However, you're still casting a spell from a magic item, and you have to read the scroll in order to cast a spell from it, which allows it to be counterspelled. Remember, counterspell doesn't require you to see your opponent using some kind of components. It just requires you to see someone casting a spell, no matter how they're doing it. However, there are ways to hide that you're casting a spell, specifically with the subtle spell feature that sorcerers are able to use, which allows you to cast spells without a verbal or somatic component. So, if you subtle spell something like Misty Step, which only requires a verbal component, then removing that component allows it to be uncounterspellable, and thus immune to the counterspell spell. However, if you're using a spell that has a material component, which is not removed by subtle spell, like Fireball, which requires all three components, a verbal, somatic, and material, then even if you subtle spell a fireball, it can still be counterspelled because you still have to provide the material component, which is not hidden. So if you want to get around a counterspell and you're a sorcerer with subtle spell, you want to heavily invest in spells that only have verbal and somatic components, which about half of the sorcerer spells are. And then there's also innate spell casting, which can allow you to cast spells that can't be counterspelled either, but only if the innate spell casting specifically says it requires no components. Like the stat block for Sephic Caltro, for example. It has the innate spell casting feature, which specifically states that it can innately cast Misty Step three times a day, requiring no components at all. Which means it cannot be counterspelled, just like with Subtle Spell. However, if we look at something like the Droki, which also has innate spell casting, its innate spell casting specifically mentions that it can innately cast the following spells, requiring no material components. So, if it tries to cast the Fear spell, which it can use once per day, they still have to provide the verbal and somatic components, even if they don't have to provide any of the material ones. Which means it can be counterspelled, even though they're using it through their innate spellcasting feature. And this is how a lot of spellcaster monsters work. Their innate spellcasting usually only removes the material components and not the verbal or somatic ones. And there's also the rulings where, if you wish to use your ready action ability to hide behind cover and cast a spell, and then create the trigger for the spell being, as soon as you move out of cover, this spell is cast at point A. 
You can actually avoid a counter spell in this way because you already cast the spell behind the cover and you're just releasing it with your reaction, which counter spell does not stop. And there's also a couple of other niche rulings with counter spell, but those are the big basic ones that you should probably know about. And in number four, we'll go over a couple of variant rules that come up a lot in the comments of the last video. It has a whole bunch of rules that you probably think are part of the base game, but are actually variant rules, which are optional rules in nature. The first one being feats. These are extra options you can pick up when you gain an ability score increase, where you can forego taking an ability score increase in order to take a feat instead. And some races give you a feat at level one. Some feats are incredibly powerful and they allow you to vastly customize your character and increase their power level significantly. And the whole thing is entirely an optional ruling. Multiclassing is also technically a variant rule, where baseline you're only supposed to level up with one class and you never get to change it or take levels in other classes. Flanking is also an optional rule, which is the rule of gaining advantage on an attack if you have an ally directly on the other side of the enemy you're fighting. Inspiration is also a variant rule, which is kind of surprising since most character sheets have a spot to mark your point of inspiration, where you can use a point of inspiration to just give yourself advantage on something. Hitting cover, this is a rule which can allow an ally to hit another ally with a ranged attack if they miss the attack roll. Basically, this rule makes it so if something is providing cover and an attack roll against them would miss, but only because of the extra AC provided by the cover, then the attack will hit whatever's providing that cover instead. So, if you have an ally in front of something you're trying to attack it, and that ally is providing a plus 2 AC bonus to them because of cover, then if you miss your attack by only like a roll of 1, your attack will hit your ally instead, or whatever is providing the cover. This is a variant rule, but my first DM used to use this as a baseline, so I used to believe it was part of the base game as well. Using different ability scores for skills is also a variant rule. So, if you want a fighter to intimidate using their strength score rather than charisma, this variant rule allows you to do so. And finally, group checks are not a variant rule, but are worded in a way where the DM can choose to employ a group check or not. So, it's in the category of technically official, but your DM can just choose to never use them if they don't want to, just like a variant rule. And a group check is basically, if at least half the group succeeds on an ability check, everyone succeeds. So, if you want the group to succeed a stealth check to get a surprise on an enemy group, a group check is the best way to succeed, since a single person eluding the group can ruin it for everyone else. However, a DM can just tell you no, and have everyone roll individual stealth rolls, and it's also perfectly rules as written. And at number three, we'll go over one of the things I got a lot of comments about, which is how cover works. Cover is something that should come up in most combat encounters because creatures can provide half cover. But the way cover works is a lot different than a lot of other things in 5e, since it actually provides numerical bonuses rather than just advantage or disadvantage. So if a target has half cover, where if you determine that something is blocking about a half of its body, then if you try to target a creature that has half cover, they have a plus two bonus to their AC and dexterity saving throws. If a target has three quarters cover, where basically most of their body is covered, but not all of it, they get a plus five bonus to their AC and dexterity saving throws. And if they're completely covered, where you can't target them with a direct attack or spell, then attacks or spells that target cannot be used on them, unless the spell targets an area, in which case you can possibly hit them with the area of effect. Now, what kind of cover obstacles and creatures provide is entirely up to your DM but there are some suggestions in the rules for cover, and one of them should come up pretty often, and that's the rules for half cover, where some of the obstacles mentioned are a low wall, a large piece of furniture, a narrow tree trunk, or a creature, whether that creature is an enemy or a friend. So if you're a ranged attacker trying to shoot an enemy through an ally who might be in front of them, then that technically counts as half cover, and they have a plus two bonus to their AC. And half cover should come up quite often in normal games, especially in dungeons where people are fighting in narrow hallways. And then, when it comes to open forest areas, there's actually trees to hide behind, then it gets a little bit more muddied on whether you're getting half cover or three quarters cover, or if you're just going to the category of full total cover. The rules on this are kind of loose. I assume the reason people mention this in the comments so much is because enemy and friendly creatures can technically provide half cover, which should come up a lot in normal games. And there's also the variant rule we talked about earlier, where it's possible to accidentally hit an ally with one of your attacks. Say you're trying to hit a creature that has 15 AC, but one of yours, or one of the enemy creature's allies, is standing directly in front of them, blocking your line of sight, granting them half cover, and a plus two bonus to their AC. If you rolled a 16 on that attack roll, it will miss because their new AC is 17. Although, if you're using the variant rule, 
your attack roll will instead hit whatever's providing that cover and deal damage to them. Or if you rolled below the original AC, then the attack just misses like normal and no one gets hit. And at number two, we have some clarifications on passive skills. Passive skills are determined by 10 plus any modifiers you'd normally get to the check. And having advantage or disadvantage in that skill gives you a plus five or minus five to that passive score. Passive perception is easily the most used passive skill in the game. However, there are actually rules for passive skills for all of your skills. In fact, one of the feats refers to your passive investigation score and even provides a plus five bonus to it in addition to your passive perception. The reason it's super useful for passive perception is because perception is probably the most useful skill in the game, because it's basically the skill that allows you to perceive the world around you with your senses, as special abilities can provide you additional bonuses to perceptions based on how you use your perception, like through your sight, hearing, or smell. So passive perception just kind of refers to constantly being alert for hidden tracks or stuff. That way you don't have to constantly roll perception checks on every encounter. But technically, there are passive scores of every skill. They're just not really as useful as a passive perception. So if you want, you could use your passive investigation to not have to roll to investigate something. Or maybe even a passive sleight of hand in order to pickpocket someone without having to attempt to roll. Or potentially get unlucky and roll a 1. Since the DM determines which skills you have to use in order to do checks anyway, it's entirely up to the DM if they even want to allow you to use a passive skill. So it's not like you can tell your DM that you want to use a passive sleight of hand. And instead, that's just an option the DM can choose so that you don't have to roll. Like if the 20 strength barbarian is trying to pick up a heavy object, they could just automatically succeed rather than having to perform an athletics check due to their passive athletics check. Or maybe you use passive insight to determine that a noble is being suspicious. Passive acrobatics to run along a tightrope. Alternatively, there's also the variant rule called automatic success which allows you to skip rolls to automatically succeed an ability check by using your score in that skill minus five. So if you wanted to bust down a heavy door that had a DC 15 strength check and you had a 20 in strength, then with the automatic success rule, you could just do it without a roll since 20 minus five is 15 and that would succeed the DC. But also a thing to remember is that passive checks and the auto success rule do not create a fallback number either, as that's a feature of some subclasses unless it's passive perception, as there was a specific rulings clarifications by Sage Advice in a podcast stating that you can never roll a perception check lower than your passive perception, and this is because passive perception is always on. So if you're looking for something with an active perception check, then you're already aware of everything that your passive perception has already picked up passively, and you're just trying to gleam new information. If something is noticeable by a person's passive perception score, they should already have noticed it. Mm. <laughs> so the, the really the, the active search is trying to find something that you haven't already noticed. And your passive perception score represents what you have already noticed. Uh, so that, I think that, sometime, that, that interaction sometimes uh, isn't entirely clear in groups' minds. And yeah. I think keeping that in mind would make certain uh, perception and stealth situations clearer. So if you do an active perception check, you have a minimum you can roll based on your passive perception, but not with other passive skills. Passive perception is so much more important than all the other passive skills that it's the only passive skill printed on every single monster in the monster manual. And at number one, we have dark vision interactions. Another one of the comments I got in my past video was the interactions with dark vision and passive perception and how they relate to lightly obscured and heavily obscured areas and rules. Basically, let's go over all of that. Lightly obscured is an environmental rule, where if something is lightly obscured, you have disadvantage on perception checks that rely on sight. Heavily obscured is an environmental rule, where if something is heavily obscured, you treat it as if you have the blinded condition, even if you're not actually blinded. And the blinded condition just gives you disadvantage on attack rolls and doesn't allow you to use abilities that require a target that you can see. And there are three levels of light. Bright light, which doesn't have any negatives. Dim light, which counts things within it as lightly obscured and darkness, which counts everything in it as heavily obscured. And then finally, we have dark vision, which is an ability a lot of creatures and player races have that allows you to see in darkness as if it was dim light, and dim light as if it was bright light. So, because of dark vision, and because of how easy it is to obtain dark vision, a lot of players just won't use torches when they're in a dark dungeon. But this does technically mean they're seeing everything in dim light, which gives them disadvantage on their perception checks. And based on the passive rules for perception, you technically have a minus five to your passive score if you have disadvantage on it. However, 
Lightly Obscured only gives you disadvantage on perception checks that specifically have to do with sight, and not all perception checks, which is an important distinction to make, because perception relies on more than just what you can see. Take a dire wolf, for example, which has the keen hearing and smell. That gives it advantage on all of its perception checks that rely on hearing or smell. So, there's a precedent set that basically amounts to the perception skill as a whole relying on more than just sight. So, even though you technically have disadvantage on perception that has to do with sight, your total passive perception should still be exactly the same. Because you can still hear and smell things and use your other senses with no issues. And proceed with all of your other senses which aren't dulled by the lack of light. So, there's no straight minus 5 to your passive perception score on a whole if you're relying on dark vision in a dark area. However, there is still something to talk about with this, because it can give you a minus 5 in some situations. Even though dim light doesn't give you disadvantage on all perception checks, it could be argued that the ability to find traps in dungeons is a passive perception check that you're using with your eyes, and not your ears or smelling. In which case, the passive perception to find traps could be lowered by minus 5. As in the rules for passive checks, one of the options for how to use a passive check is or can be used when the DM wants to secretly determine whether the character succeeds at something without rolling dice, such as noticing a hidden monster. So, if your DM wants to specifically do a hidden roll using your sight-based passive perception, then they can apply a minus 5 to it if you're relying on dark vision only, and it would be entirely rules as written, as passive perception basically follows all of the same rules as a normal check, except for the fact that there's no dice rolls involved and the DM can do them in secret. But, they don't have to add a minus 5 either. This is something you probably want to ask your DM about, on if they're going to have specific rules for disadvantage on sight-based perception checks in secret, and whether you should just light a torch or not. So while dark vision doesn't grant you an automatic minus 5 to your passive perception, it can give you a minus 5 to finding traps or hidden doors in a dark dungeon. But it does not give you a minus 5, for example, if creatures are trying to sneak up on you in those same dungeons and your DM is contesting their stealth rolls to your group's passive perception, since you should still be able to hear or smell those sneaking up creatures on you just fine. In the Player's Handbook, Dungeon Master's Guide, and various supplements, there's lots of rules for things you probably didn't even know about, which are so niche in their applications that some of them even say they're basically optional, because they don't want to muddy down the game with too many mechanics for simple things. So in this list, we're going to look at some of those rules which technically exist, but rarely, if ever, show up in games for whatever niche reasons. Starting off at number 10, we have tying for initiative. This is probably the most general rule that will be on this list, which is why it's only the number 10 spot. And the ruling for this is what happens if two people roll the same number on initiative, and how you decide who goes first in initiative order. It is commonly ruled that whoever has the higher dexterity score gets priority in the turn order, when actually the rules for a tie initiative is that the DM simply decides the order for the initiative if it's an NPC creature, and the players get to decide amongst themselves which characters go first if it's player characters. And if there is a tie between a player and a DM-controlled creature, then the DM gets to decide who goes first, or the DM can call for another roll of another dice that they want in order to decide who goes first. Now, creatures rolling the same number initiative is something that definitely comes up much more often than a lot of other things on this list. But all this time, I thought whoever just had the high deck score went first, so I was kind of surprised to find out that's not how it's written in the player's handbook which is why I thought I should share this one fact with you guys at the number 10 spot. And at number 9, we have suffocating. If you ever fall into a body of water and start to drown, how long are you able to stay underwater before you start actually taking damage? Well, that's where the suffocation rules come into play. A creature is able to hold its breath for at least one minute, plus its constitution modifier minutes. So if you have a 14 constitution score, then you can hold your breath for three minutes, since that 14 would give you additional two minutes of breath thanks to your constitution modifier. However, if you have a negative constitution modifier, you don't have a negative amount of minutes you can hold your breath, because the minimum time is 30 seconds. Once a creature runs out of breath, it's able to survive for a number of rounds equal to its constitution modifier. So in the given example, if you have a constitution score of 14, you can survive for two rounds before you suffer negative effects, or a minimum of one round if you have a zero or negative constitution modifier. And finally, at the start of your next turn, you drop to zero hit points and then start dying, where you roll death saves like normal. So you might be able to live for an additional two rounds after falling unconscious. However, I will say, in nearly every game that I've ever played, including one that took place almost entirely on a boat and around islands surrounded by water, I've never once needed the rules for suffocating because generally, players or creatures have found ways to get out of the water, and it's just never really been a viable way of dealing damage because it's much faster to just do damage normally to a creature than it is to try to drown it. 
Especially since it would take a minimum of 30 seconds, which is 5 rounds of combat, and that's the length of a normal combat encounter. Plus, monsters typically have high constitution scores anyway. And at number 8, we have going without a long rest. Have you ever wondered what the negative side effects of never performing a long rest are? Well, just like the previous example, I've never run or been in a game where players weren't dying to have a long rest in order to recover all the resources. However, there are rules in Xanathar's Guide to Everything where there are negative consequences for players that routinely don't sleep. Basically, the rules are, if you want to account for the effects of sleep deprivation, whenever a player goes 24 hours without finishing a long rest, you can have the character perform a DC 10 constitution saving throw, otherwise suffer one level of exhaustion. Then, the DC increases by 5 for every additional 24 hour period after the first that they go without a long rest. So, on day 2 with no sleep, they have a DC 15 constitution save, which goes up to a DC 20 on day 3, and so on and so on. The DC does not reset to 10 until you finish a long rest. So the rules are pretty fair when it comes to giving exhaustion, because it's kind of easy to avoid the first check with only a DC 10, but once a DC becomes 15, then it becomes a lot harder to avoid. And simply taking a long rest removes one level of exhaustion, which also resets the DC back to its base value. So the rules for this are actually pretty in line with how sleep deprivation might work on actual humans who go too long without sleeping. Although if you go way too long without sleeping with this rule, there is the possibility that you reach 6 levels of exhaustion and die, and pretty easily too, because the DC will just get really high to the point where there's no way to reasonably succeed the save. And at number 7, we have the rules for tying a knot. Have you ever been in a situation where your character's backstory has it so they're really good at tying knots? Like maybe a sailor or a pirate? and you get into a situation where tying a super good knot would probably be beneficial? Well, luckily, there is actually rules for this exact scenario. If you wish to tie a knot in order to show the effectiveness of that knot and make it harder to get out of, what you can do is perform an intelligence sleight of hand check, and it is specifically intelligence and not dexterity, which is usually used for sleight of hand, in order to show the innate knowledge of knowing how to tie a knot. Then, based on your super good knot that you just tied, whatever roll you get for the sleight of hand check becomes the DC to beat for a creature to untie that knot with their own intelligence-based sleight of hand check, or for them to slip out of it with a dexterity acrobatics check. And likewise, you are also able to slip out of a knot with the same kind of checks if you so choose. This is one of the few official rules that actually swaps out the normal attribute of a check with something else, while this is actually a variant rule for other scenarios. The whole knot tying thing is more of a variant rule anyways, as you don't need to perform an intelligence based sleight of hand check every time you wish to tie a knot, because even the rules for tying knots mentions that there's no reason to have the check for mundane activities. The rules I just explained are for players who want to try to tie an especially extravagant knot, or escape one, and not really one your DM should force you to do every time you're trying to tie a rope. And at number 6 we have casting while moving. In order to ritual cast something, a feature that almost all spellcasters have access to, you must spend 10 minutes casting the spell in addition to whatever cast number the spell is, which allows you to cast the spell without expending a spell slot. And ritual casting is very good, because being able to use spells without a spell slot is just great value. However, since it takes 10 minutes to actually perform a ritual cast, most of the time that 10 minutes is just hand waved, and also it's usually done outside of combat. But there are some special rules that apply when you're ritual casting a spell, where any spell that takes longer than an action or reaction to cast requires you to maintain concentration on that spell for the whole cast time, because if you lose concentration, the spell would just fizzle out and fail to cast. But at least losing concentration does not expend a spell slot. The only thing that happens is that you have to start over. Also, you are allowed to move while casting a ritual spell. You don't actually have to stand still for the whole 10 minutes. So it's possible to just get one prepped while you're going through a dungeon in order to have it ready at maybe some other location that you have to walk to. Although you definitely don't want to get into combat while trying to finish a ritual cast, because you have to spend each of your turns using your action to cast that one spell, and that one spell only, while maintaining your concentration on it, which leaves you unable to do really anything else. And at number 5, we have sleeping in armor. Now, I'm sure most people know about the niche rules when it comes to putting on and taking off armor, and how it can take a long time to remove heavy armor, as it takes 10 minutes to just put it on. And because it takes so long to don and doff armor, most of the time characters will just never take it off, even going so far as to sleep in it, just in case they're attacked in the middle of the night. Which basically makes the rules for donning and doffing armor only really matter for cases like being the target of a heat metal spell. However, there are extra rules that can be applied if a character is sleeping in their armor, which are detrimental to the point where characters might actually take off their armor before going to sleep. In Xanadar's Guide to Everything, they have extra rules about penalties for sleeping in medium or heavy armor. If you sleep in light armor, you have no such adverse effects. However, if you finish a long rest while sleeping in heavy or medium armor, you only regain one quarter of your spent hit die, where normally you recover half of them after a long rest. 
In addition, if you had any levels of exhaustion, they won't be reduced after long rest, where normally you lose at least one level of exhaustion after a long rest. You still, however, gain back all abilities that refresh in a long rest, and still hold up to full health. So the only penalties are to the amount of hit dice you recover, and the rule of recovering one level of exhaustion after a long rest. So it is detrimental with these rules, but not game-punishingly so. If you want to encourage your players to actually remove their armor during a long rest because you want to ambush them in the middle of the night, then adding these rules will definitely encourage them to say that they remove their armor before sleeping. And at number four, we have alien technology. Sometimes in a campaign, your characters might come across strange items that's from different timelines or dimensions altogether. Maybe your characters run across a calculator that somehow got traveled through time and space to their medieval time period. Or maybe they stumble across an alien ship full of antimatter rifles. If a character finds an object that's definitely outside of what they should know, there are rules in place for figuring out how alien technology is supposed to work. And the rules are just a series of intelligence checks. Where in order to figure out something simple, like maybe a cigarette lighter or a calculator, it requires two successes. But something more complicated like a computer or a hovercraft can require up to four successes, based on how complicated you think the item is to figure out. In order to succeed on the checks, all you have to do is just roll higher than a 15. If you roll 14 or lower, then you have one failure. And the rules suggest having the item break if you fail four or more times before you're taking a long rest. There's also a little table for figuring out the alien technology, where if you roll lower than a 9, you have disadvantage on your next check. But if you roll higher than a 20, you have advantage on your next check instead. And there are some official modules that randomly throw alien technology at your characters, where they give you the rules in the module so that your characters have a chance to use it. But I don't want to spoil any ice-based campaigns where this might be the case, so I will not say what the alien tech is or where it can be found. However, just because you figure out how something works doesn't mean you have proficiency in it. So if you do figure out how to use some alien weapon, it might not be more effective than just swinging around an axe or using a bow and arrow. And at number three, we have visibility ranges. Sometimes when you're trying to look for something in a wide open field or in a large city, you might want to know what are the specific numbers when it comes to what you're actually able to see with your character. And sometimes there's even items or abilities that have to target something that you can see. But how far can your character see? Well, with the visibility outdoor rules, your character can see about two miles in any direction on a clear day, or until there's trees, hills, or other obstructions that block the view. And if it's raining, then the visibility is cut down to one mile, and fog cuts it down to between one to 300 feet. In addition, if your character is on top of a really tall mountain, hill, building, or flight in the air, a character can see 40 miles out on a clear day, with the normal ranges for rain and fog. So if you're trying to track something that's running away from you in a big, open area, you're able to see quite far. And at number two, we have other activities while traveling. If you're traveling between places, there are rules in place where all party members contribute their passive perception to the travel in order to increase the chance of noticing a hidden threat. However, you are able to forego this benefit in order to perform other functions while traveling, which might help your group. If you're traveling in an area that doesn't have a path or something similar to follow, there is a chance you might become lost. Where if you're in a forest, jungle, swampy area, or some other terrain where there's no land in sight, you have to make a DC 15 survival check or else you get lost. However, if one person in the group volunteers to be the navigator, they remove their passive perception score from the group and are able to perform the survival check necessary in order to not become lost if the DM calls for it. And then there's extra rules about having advantage based on other factors, like having stars in the sky to follow. Alternatively, a character can volunteer to draw a map, where it just simply records your group's progress and allows you to get back on course automatically if you do get lost without requiring any ability checks. Because if you do get lost, you end up traveling in the wrong direction, and you can't have your navigator perform another check until you get back on course, which takes 1d6 hours. With a map, this becomes instant. You can also have someone designate themselves as a tracker, which allows you to follow the tracks of another creature if you're tracking something on your travels, which has its own set of rules. And finally, the fourth thing you can do while traveling is designate yourself as a forager, where you get to keep an eye out for sources of food and water, allowing you to forage while you're traveling using the rules for foraging. Now, the reason you rarely see these kinds of rules show up is because a lot of people just kind of hand wave traveling where you don't have to worry about any of these things and generally just arrive at your destination immediately and then just say a couple of days went by or something. Although if you actually go through all the rules for traveling in wilderness exploration, then you're probably familiar with all the things I just talked about. And finally, number one, definitely a rule you've never heard about, but that could technically be applied to any of your campaigns. And that's the rule for whether or not a whisper can wake you up while you're asleep. You see, there's special rules in Xanathar's Guide to Everything to explain how someone might be woken up by noises while they're sleeping. If there's a sudden loud noise, like yelling or thunder, this will wake someone up naturally. 
or a creature can use an action to shake or slap a wig another creature, which is definitely important for nighttime ambushes. However, what if someone is whispering in the same room as someone who's sleeping? What is required for a character to be woken up by that whisper? Well, if your character, who is asleep, has a passive perception score that's 20 or higher, then any whispers within 10 feet of them will wake them up. If someone's speaking at a normal volume and you're in an environment which is otherwise silent, like no street noises or wind or crickets, then if the sleeper has a passive perception score of 15 or higher, they're woken up. So, there you go. They have special rules for what volume of sound will wake you up based on your passive perception scores, which kind of makes sense when you think about it, which is the case for a lot of these extra rules for really niche and mundane things. In the rule books for a D&D 5e, there are a lot of random additions on a whole bunch of pages, which list varying rules that can be added to whatever they're talking about currently in order to make things more interesting. So in this list, we'll be going over a lot of those extra varying rules you can add to your game, which are listed in official D&D sources. At number 10, we have Hitting Cover. The variant rule for this only applies when adding extra AC for cover. The ruling is, if there is something in between you and the target you're trying to hit, the target will have either half cover, which gives them plus 2 to their AC, 3 quarters cover, which gives them plus 5 to their AC, or full cover, which means you can't hit them. And the most common things that provide half cover is just other characters on the battlefield. So if you're trying to shoot a creature that has one other creature in front of it, then the creature has half cover by default or your DM can rule through force cover depending on the situation, like if it's a vastly bigger creature than the other creature. So if a creature had an AC of 15 normally, and you tried to shoot your bow at it and roll a 16, normally that would be good enough to hit. However, adding a half cover, they gain extra plus two to their AC, so you would actually miss with their new AC at 17. And then with hitting cover, the variant rule, what this means is that if your attack roll misses because of cover, it instead hits whatever is providing the cover, assuming the attack roll is also able to hit that. So in this scenario, if the creature providing the half cover has an AC that's below 16, they are hit instead by the attack instead of your intended target. Without the variant rule, the attack would just miss and nothing else happens. This variant rule sounds a lot more complicated than it actually is, and is overall not super impactful to a normal battlefield, but it is a pretty neat variant rule you can add, and definitely makes sense within the context of the world. So I thought I would add this to this video if only at the number 10 spot. There are much more impactful rules later on in this video. And at number nine, we have skills with different attributes. This is a variant rule which simply states, if you're trying to perform a skill check, you can use one of your other various attributes for that skill instead of the default one. For example, if you're proficient in athletics and you need to do a marathon swim from an offshore an island to the mainland, your DM can ask you to roll a constitution-based athletics check to signify you're using stamina in order to make it that far, rather than a strength-based athletics check, which would normally be the default. Or probably one of the more common ways to use this variant rule is if you're a big, burly character trying to make an intimidation check. You can allow them to use strength as the attribute instead of charisma, which is the default. In fact, a lot of games already use this variant rule, but only for intimidation in this specific case. But technically, the variant rule allows you to do it for pretty much every ability, just as long as the DM okays it. And at number 8, we have automatic success. This is a rule which is different from passive skills and basically means if you're trying to do an ability check, instead of performing a roll for it, you can just automatically succeed if your score on that check is 5 higher than the DC. So, for example, say you need to break down a door which would have a DC of 15, and your character has a 20 strength score. You could use this variant rule to automatically break that door without any roll, because 20 minus 5 equals 15, and you'd be able to automatically succeed. This is a rule in order to kind of skip rolls on things that your character should never really fail at, like a 20 strength character being able to break down a wooden door. However, it only applies to ability checks and doesn't apply to saving throws, attack rolls, or contests, where two characters would roll against each other. There is also an additional part of this variant rule which states if you are proficient in a tool, you can also automatically succeed on tool checks if the DC is 10 or less. But if your character is level 11 or higher, then your character can automatically succeed on tools checks that are of DC of 15 or less. So automatic success is actually pretty hard to activate, since you need to beat the initial check by a 5 with your base score, but it definitely makes sense that you'd be able to succeed something automatically if your attribute in that skill is 5 higher than the DC. Part of the reason this is only an optional rule is because DMs or players might want a risk of failure, and smart players will just try to match whatever character has the highest ability score to whatever problem they're currently facing for an automatic success, 
and it might take some of the fun out of the game. And at number 7, we have the disarm rule. The disarm action is a special combat option which makes it so you can disarm a foe you're fighting by attacking the weapon in their hand instead of the creature themselves. And the way you do this is you roll an attack roll like normal, except the target is the weapon you're trying to disarm instead of the creature. Although it still counts as targeting a creature, so you don't have to worry about rulings about what can or can't a target a certain item or creature. And then, the creature you target for the disarm has to make either an athletics or acrobatics check, where if that check is a higher roll than your attack roll, the disarm fails. However, if your attack roll is higher than the skill check and you win the contest, then the attack causes no damage or ill effects, but it causes the defender to drop their item. And also, you have disadvantage on the attack roll if the creature is holding the weapon with two hands, or if the creature is of a size larger than you. But you have advantage on the attack roll if the creature is of a size smaller than you. Now, the main problem with the disarm combat option is that Battlemaster's fighters kind of have an ability similar in their class. Although overall, the Battlemaster disarm is better, so it's not exactly the same and would probably be fine to add to any game, as it's just an option you can do instead of doing damage. And at number 6, we have another combat option called Mark. Mark is a special ability that doesn't require any other actions other than meeting the conditions, where if you make a melee attack against a creature, you can choose to designate that creature as your mark. What this means is, until the end of your next turn, any opportunity attacks you make against that target have advantage. And also, the biggest part of the mark variant rule, making an opportunity attack against the mark creature does not use up your reaction. So your reaction is free to do other things, just as long as it's not making another opportunity attack because the mark variant rule does limit you to only one opportunity attack per turn, if you choose to use the mark option. Which means if you have something like the shield spell or counter spell, two things that also use up your reaction, you'd be able to do either of those things and still have your opportunity attack from the mark. Assuming the opportunity attack was only against the marked creature. And assuming you are able to do it because there is another rule where, if you have some condition which would normally allow you to not perform an opportunity attack, like being incapacitated or being affected by the shocking grass spell, you can't perform this extra opportunity attack. So the mark feature is straight up buff to melee characters, and seeing how much more powerful spellcasters are in comparison to melee characters, it's probably fine to add in an average game that's going to the higher levels. And at number 5 we have a dual spot with tumble and overrun variant rules. Basically what these two rules entail are giving you a way to move through an enemy creature's space. Overrun allows you to use your strength score to go through an enemy creature's space, and Tumble just uses your dexterity. And they both go about it in slightly different ways and have some slightly different rules. For Tumble, you can use an action or bonus action in order to perform an acrobatics check contested by the enemy creature's acrobatics check. And if you win the contest, you're able to move through their space one time this turn as if it's difficult terrain, since there's rulings in other parts of the book that go over what happens when you move through another creature's space where it's counted as difficult terrain even if it's not listed in this variant rule itself. Then with Overrun, you can also use an action or bonus action in order to perform an athletics contest with the creature you're trying to move through the space of. And if you win the athletics contest, which you have advantage on if you're larger than the creature, or disadvantage if you're smaller, you're able to just move through the creature's space once this turn. But you can't move them to one side or anything. It literally just lets you go through their space. So, if you want rules for being able to go through enemy creature spaces, they exist with the Overrun and Tumble variant rules. And at number 4, we have Cleaving Through Creatures. This is another variant rule which gives buff to melee characters, as what it does is, if you're fighting some low-level monsters, and you have a really big battle axe and it's doing a whole bunch of damage, you can apply that damage to other creatures nearby if the damage overkills your target. For example, say you're a high-level barbarian and you're attacking a horde of goblins, and you're completely surrounded. The goblin has an average hit point value of 7, and let's say through a bunch of modifiers, having the great weapon master feat, and rolling a maximum value on that weapon, you get something like a 25 on the damage roll. And your attack roll is high enough to beat the AC of that goblin, so you're able to kill that goblin in one hit. And that would normally be the end of that action. But with this variant rule, what you would instead do is continue the damage, where you would go to the next nearest target of your choice, and then if the initial attack roll would also meet the AC of that target, you can then apply any additional damage to them. So if it's another goblin, you would subtract another 7 from the initial amount. So the first goblin would take 7 off of the 25, leaving you with 18 damage left over. The second goblin would bring that down to 11, and you could just keep going to another nearby creature as long as they're within range. Where the next goblin would bring it down to 4, 
and then the last goblin would only take 4 damage, as that's all that's left from the initial attack. So an attack which would normally only kill one goblin, in this instant kills three and a half of them. Now, the problem with cleaving through enemies rule is that it makes hordes of small creatures less deadly. Although spellcasters get rid of hordes of low level creatures way easier than this rule does, and it's not like you're doing extra damage, just actually using all of the damage of your big hits. So it's probably a fine rule to add because it only applies to melee characters and would still make them less useful than a spellcaster using any AoE spell. Although, with the added bonus, that it's basically a walking AoE machine with this feature that doesn't have any resource restrictions tied to it like an AoE spellcaster would. And at number three, we have Healing Surges. This is a great variant rule to add to a party that doesn't have any healers, or to a party that doesn't want to have anyone forced to play a healer. As what it does is gives every creature the action where they can spend up to half of their hit die, and for each hit die spent, gain hit points equal to that total. So, normally you would spend hit die during a short rest in order to heal up for some amount. This variant rule simply allows you to do this as an action whenever you want, which includes during combat. However, there are some limitations to this. You can only use this healing surge once per short or long rest. So you can't continuously use all of your hit die in multiple battles, unless you take a short rest in between each one of them. There's also some extra bonuses to how you acquire hit dice, where after a short rest you regain hit dice equal to your level divided by 4, or a minimum of 1, and you regain all of your spent hit dice after a long rest. So you're just going to have more hit dice than normal, as normally you only regain half of your hit die after a long rest, and that's it. And you can also use your hit die during a short rest just like normal. And since you gain hit dice back after a short rest anyway with this variant rule, it just adds to a lot more healing to your characters than they would normally have access to naturally. As they can, once every rest, use an action to heal themselves for quite a bit if they spend the full amount of hit die they're allowed to. Then they can spend the rest of them after a short rest and get a fourth of them back, and then have a fourth of them to use in the next battle, which they can get back again after a short rest. And then eventually you just get them all back after a long rest. And this variant rule even has another option, which says you can let characters use Healing Surge as a bonus action, rather than an action, if you want your characters to feel like superheroes. So I would highly suggest allowing this variant rule in games with low healing, and probably not allowed in games which have more than enough of that already, since healers do like to be able to actually heal if they're playing it by choice. But nobody wants to be forced to be a healer, because no one else wanted to pick one, which is probably what this variant rule is meant for. And at number two, we have flanking. This is a variant rule that I've been using in pretty much every game I've ever played, but I'm not sure how many other tables actually use it, because I heard it's not as common. Basically, what this rule means is if you're in melee with an enemy creature, and there's another creature on the opposite side of that creature which is an ally, you and your ally have advantage on that creature, so long as you have multiple allies which get in melee range for whatever reason, or even summon player companions, it's pretty easy for a melee character with this variant rule to get advantage more often than not. Which is why a lot of tables don't allow the flanking variant rule. Because it makes advantage too easy to get as a melee character. In fact, I've heard a whole bunch of homebrew nerfs to this variant rule to only make flanking grant a bonus to the attack roll with a numerical value, rather than just giving straight advantage. Because it's real easy to get flanking, as you don't actually need to be directly on an opposite side of the other, just as long as you're able to draw an imaginary line through you and your ally, and that imaginary line touches the creature or just a quarter of the enemy space, then the enemy creature is considered flanked, which means it's super easy to gain flanking on creatures that are of a size large or bigger, a little bit more difficult to flank creatures that are medium or smaller. And since I use this ruling so much, and I've used it in other games and places where I wasn't the DM, I used to think it was just a default rule in the game, so I would obviously suggest it to everyone else. And at number one, we have hero points. Hero points are an ability score option, which means it adds an extra stat point to all the characters, similar to adding an insanity score or an honor score. However, the way hero points work are a lot more simple than all the other additional attributes you can give to characters, because basically, what hero points do is, you can spend one hero point after you make a d20 roll in order to add an additional 1d6 to it, which can be applied either to an attack roll, an ability check, or a saving throw. Additionally, if you're specifically performing a death saving throw, you can spend a hero point in order to make that failure into a success, rather than adding a d6 to the roll. And you can choose to spend the hero point after you've made the roll, but before you know the outcome of that roll. So hero points are really strong. 
They basically just give you an extra d6 to whatever critical roll you're about to perform, and you can choose to spend it after you've known you've rolled pretty low. But not low enough where you know you're automatically going to fail, and give you a chance to succeed that roll instead. And a character starts with 5 hero points at level 1, and you don't gain any new hero points until you level up. And then after you level up, your hero point score is just reset, where you gain 5 plus half your character's level. This is to incentivize actually using the hero points and not saving them up every level, and also, due to the generous amount you do get, you should be able to use them pretty liberally. Where, if you're a level 2 character, you get 6 hero points. A level 8 character will have 9 hero points, etc, etc. And hero points basically allow your character to just feel more heroic, by giving them an extra chance to succeed at all of their basic roles. Which obviously highlights the big problem with hero points, in that it just makes characters way stronger than normal. Hero points absolutely break the bounds of the game, especially in shorter games which level up very quickly. If you're playing a game where it takes you a year to level up, then hero points aren't that big a deal, and could probably be added without breaking any kind of balance. If you're playing a game where you level up once every other session, then your character will have an almost endless supply of hero points in order to spend on everything they do. However, the main benefit of hero points is alleviating some of the RNG that happens with playing the game, and allowing characters to actually feel like special heroes, rather than being left to the devices of random chance of the D20s and their normal, standard ability scores. It would make sense for a hero to have a little bit more luck than normal in a story, and hero points just kind of give you a little bit more luck than normal, but without making characters stronger by default, or just lowering the power level of everything else in the game. And characters have to make a conscious effort in order to gain that little bit more luck. So it's a great way to just make your characters feel more heroic without having the DM to fudge any of their dice rolls. I think hero points are an excellent addition to a game where you're just trying to have fun, and you don't want the characters to have a bad time because they get too many bad rolls in a row. But if you're playing a more serious game that levels up quickly, it's probably best this is a variant rule that you just ignore instead. And since it's such a good system for just a more casual setting, or a game that has a shorter level up times, I definitely think it's an excellent variant rule you can possibly add to your game, which will probably change the game a lot more than any of the other variant rules I've talked about so far, save probably flanking where it makes melee characters way more powerful. House rules are unofficial rules that players and Dungeon Masters incorporate into their home games. Most of the time these rules are there to enrich the game experience in some way, but sometimes house rules can do just the opposite. Today we're going to go over 10 of the worst house rules that are fairly common in 5th edition. Starting us off at number 10, we have Natural 20's Always Succeed house rule. Now, in certain cases, this is true in the game. Attack rolls do always succeed on a natural 20, but rules is written, that's not the case for saving throws, skill checks, and ability checks. And with those rolls, natural 20's always succeeding can be a lot more questionable. Saving throws don't cause too much of a problem, as they're mostly confined to combat, and it's rarely impossible to succeed on those saves anyhow. So a natural 20 is normally enough even without implementing a critical success. But it's a lot more suspect with skill and ability checks. Allowing players to always succeed on a 20 can be fun for the players most of the time, as it lets them succeed in otherwise hopeless situations and accomplish something their character typically wouldn't be able to do. That said, it can encourage the negative behavior of every player at the table asking to roll on skill checks in every situation just to succeed through the sheer number of dice being thrown at a problem. The actual worst part of this rather common rule is enemies always succeeding on natural 20s. Throughout a typical campaign, there are going to be more enemies than players by an order of magnitude, which means the dungeon master will end up mirroring that player strategy and throw a ton of dice at every roll. Any enemy succeeding on any check by just getting a lucky 5% chance to roll a d20 can really undermine what the player can do. Imagine a bumbling group of ogres with a minus 2 of the perception check trying to spot an epic level 20 rogue who's sneaking around. The rogue's lowest possible roll for stealth is a 25, because of their high bonus combined with a liable talent class feature that means they can't get below a 10 for their d20 rolls. Well, give 20 ogres each a chance to roll a natural 20, and it becomes trivial to completely invalidate the player's investment to develop into becoming a master of stealth. Why should that rogue roll a 19 and getting a 34 total stealth be spotted by an oblivious enemy who rolls one better? This is even more problematic in social scenarios. Social encounters have nearly entirely been defined by skill checks and various spells and abilities that require saving throws. This house rule can make an entire social encounter become undone by an incidental 20 being rolled on an insight check, even if the character in question has bad insight skills against master social manipulators. Letting the player succeed more often isn't so bad, 
but crushing player versus encounter interaction through sheer numbers completely messes up the way the game is designed to be played. That's why these types of roles are excluded in the regular rules from automatic natural 20 success, and should usually stay that way. Though admittedly, there are always exceptions. After all, the Rule of Cool is an excellent example of a great house rule, and the Rule of Cool is most often invoked on a well-timed natural 20. Just don't make it automatic. And at number 9, we have the house rule that all spellcasters must use listed material components for their spells instead of component pouches or spellcasting focuses. This one is very common, as it was the way spellcasting naturally worked in older editions. There would even be class abilities or feats you could take to avoid having to obtain and keep track of otherwise inconsequential spell materials. In the translation to later editions of the game, this was removed so there would be a lot less bookkeeping to play a spellcaster, which already required the extra bookkeeping of keeping track of your spells in the first place. Now, this isn't inherently a bad house rule. It fits very well in more survival-based games where resource management and scarcity is an integral part to the theme of the setting. Having to keep track of your components and potentially decide what spells to learn because of the difficulty certain components have to find can really benefit the immersion. Where it gets questionable is your more common heroic fantasy games. Oftentimes, dungeon masters will use this house rule as a way to control the spellcasters in the game rather than think of a workaround to powerful spells. By just denying access to the material components, they can force the player to avoid certain spells or being able to use them at all. But a house rule that exists just to limit or punish players can feel really unfair. That's why just being able to have and use a focus for most of your spells is pretty important to the accessibility of the more complicated spellcaster classes. And removing that for a little to no thematic reason only adds to the frustration and difficulty of the game for the players. It's already just an option for players to use material opponents instead if they want to enrich the roleplay of their spellcasting after all. Players can naturally choose between component pouches, focuses, or acquiring the materials and using them. A dungeon master forcing it on them without good reason for purposes of controlling the players, or for just being used to the older editions, is the more common way this pops up and isn't very healthy for the game. The mechanics still exist with spells that have rare or costly materials, most notably something like Hero's Feast. And these spells are powerful enough to justify the extra bit of investment. Doing it for every spell turns a rare hunt for a powerful material into a chore the spellcaster has to deal with constantly. This rule is something Dungeons & Dragons has mostly done away with, and for pretty good reason. And at number 8, we have Forcing Party Composition. This is another holdover from very early Dungeons & Dragons, along with some hobby crossovers from role-playing video games. The idea is that for a party to succeed, it must have characters who fulfill certain roles is all too common in Dungeons & Dragons space. Now, some of this is actually player imposed. Players who come to a game later or start working on creating their characters later might naturally gravitate to trying to fill in the roles that the other party characters don't fill. And there's nothing wrong with trying to make a cohesive team like that so long as it's the player's choice to do so. Things become more problematic when the dungeon master and the other players force certain classes or roles into the party composition. This creates a gatekeeping and first come first serve environment to character building instead of natural exploration of the classes and roles that the players feel interested in. There is really nothing inherently wrong with a party with two bards, fighters, or multiple classes of anything really. It might seem redundant, but plenty of players have played the same class multiple times and had vastly different roles and experiences with these different characters despite being the same class. The same is true for multiples of the same class in a party. More importantly, forced class stipulation is also often used as a crush for encounter building. It's easier for a dungeon master to just throw out any encounter based on CR if you have a perfectly balanced party. But a less versatile group might need particular creative encounter design that suits their party. For example, if the party doesn't have a wizard or artificer, then the dungeon master should probably avoid the team needing a specific arcana check to continue on a questline, or at least give them a viable alternative that does suit their capabilities. It's generally a much more enriching experience for the world building to suit the players, as opposed to the players being forced into roles they might not be comfortable or happy with just to fit the idea of a correct party composition. That said, like any rule, there are exceptions. Certain settings might be enriched by things like arcane spellcasting being illegal, so players might need to seek an underground wizard mentor to access the class. A good narrative hook is a bit different from outright banning, and is a more elegant way to implement class limitation. And at number 7, we have banning multiclassing. Multiclassing has a tumultuous history in Dungeons & Dragons. Historically, multiclassing was how you would break the game in dozens of different ways. The problem was that, over time, certain additions would add far too many alternative class options that would stack or combine in ways to create some sort of impossibly strong character. So a lot of older school Dungeon Masters have an understandable aversion to it. And there are some powerful multi-class combinations in 5th edition, but nothing that's truly that game-breaking compared to the horribly broken combinations of something like 3rd edition. Multi-classing shouldn't ever be completely banned because all that does in reality is significantly limit player options. 
It stops them from exploring new avenues from the character or even trying out new combinations they've heard of that can be fun for the player to explore. Now, on a case-by-case -case basis, limiting multiclassing options isn't that big of a deal. It's perfectly reasonable for a dungeon master to tell the paladin they can't multiclass into Warlock on a whim. Maybe the character has no access to an entity that has the power to grant the Warlock abilities. But the player only wants to do it for a powerful class combination and not for any real in-game reason that makes sense for that character. But if that paladin does have a really interesting narrative connection to an entity that might be able to grant them Warlock capabilities, why not let them explore that? After all, that lawful good paladin seeking power from a divinely good celestial patron wouldn't be contrary to the character at all, and might be more direct way they can show the connection to the divine. And that's just one common example where it can be good or bad to allow multiclassing. But the option should always be there. And banning that just because of an inherent and largely outdated version of multiclassing doesn't really do anyone any favors. Although I should add that multiclassing is an optional rule in D&D 5e. So, if this one is banned, it's more of a case of not allowing people to use this optional rule and less of a ban. And at number 6, we have hyper-realistic combat house rules. The rule is less about player and dungeon master choice and exploration of the game, and more about how combat works in Dungeons & Dragons. A lot of dungeon masters might try to add some realism to their combats by implementing something like a table for where the body and attack hits, and another table for side effects or being hit in certain spots. Examples including things like getting hit in the arm might impose disadvantage on your next attack, that uses the arm or getting hit in the leg might have your movement speed halved until your next turn. While on a case-by-case -case basis, putting in some consequences for being hurt can add another layer of depth and interest in combat, the real problem with rules like these is the fact that Dungeons & Dragons combat is already relatively long-winded. Adding multiple extra rolls and tables to the already complicated enough combat system can really bog down gameplay. A fight that might take one hour of real time could easily double in length because of house rules like these. Also, making players keep track of multiple disabling status conditions or problems they've occurred by taking damage is begging for mistakes to be made, and many of these to be forgotten throughout the course of a fight. This is why 5th edition lumped all floating bonuses into the advantage and disadvantage system, so as to streamline negative statuses and buffs compared to previous editions. This kind of simulated realistic combat exists in other role-playing systems, where hyper-realistic combat is the entire purpose of the game, which is why it's commonly adapted to some Dungeons & Dragons tables. A dungeon master with experience in those other games might have liked it there, and is trying to get the same positive feeling in their own D&D game. But those systems and games are made with those rules in mind, and just stapling them into Dungeons & Dragons is often more clunky than just playing the other systems in the first place. And at number 5, we have allowing all third-party D&D content. Now, third-party content isn't inherently bad. Some third-party content eventually becomes just regular content. A recent example of this is Matthew Mercer's Exandria third-party content that has made the transition to be an official Wizards product. But Matthew Mercer is one of the most popular figures in the hobby, and his third-party content designs have more player testers available to try them out than even Wizards of the Coast do. So he gets a lot more feedback on balancing problems than your average third-party developer will. Most third-party content doesn't get nearly enough playtesting, and even those that do are often incentivized to make overpowered content to attract power gamers who are interested in that sort of thing. A blanket allowance of third-party content turns the game less into building a character to suit a story or narrative or interesting idea, and more into a game about who's the best at googling the most powerful third-party content to squeeze into a game so they don't feel useless. Being drawn to making mechanically optimal characters isn't inherently bad or wrong in Dungeons & Dragons. After all, there's nothing that stops an optimal character from being roleplayed to their best compared to an unoptimized character. But when the power difference between characters becomes too vast, the game can devolve into a minority of the characters solving all the problems, leaving the others out of it. A dungeon master not vetting third-party content invites this schism into the group, and it's rarely for the best. You should never really allow just any third-party content unless you're 100% sure your players have a good eye for avoiding stuff that's too powerful or absurd. And at number 4, we have starting over from level 1 when a character dies. Character death is a part of Dungeons and & Dragons, and for some dungeon masters, a long-standing house rule is that when you start a new character, no matter what, you start over from level 1. This is a holdover from 1st edition, where players would often have multiple characters and there wasn't a huge difference between a level 2 or level 1 character. Both were probably going to die anyhow. As the game has grown, character progression has gotten more intricate and important to how you play the game. Not to mention, lethality is largely concentrated at low levels instead of the game constantly being lethal like it was in its earliest editions. This can lead to a player having to sort of death spiral as a level 1 character struggles to stay alive in challenges designed for their higher level party members. And also for the party to struggle a bit by trying to pick up the slack of an underpowered level 1 character. The goal of a rule like this is to maintain a sense of progression for characters, and maybe to avoid things like having this random person who's as powerful as your level of party members appearing out of nowhere. This can break immersion to a degree, 
but protecting that immersion is rarely worth the consequences of forcing a player who already suffered the loss of a character to endure a lot more hardship for wanting to keep playing the game. There is some fun to be had with a party that has disproportionate levels and capabilities though. Earlier editions of the game had different character classes level up at different rates as sort of a balance mechanic to curb how powerful spellcasters eventually become compared to their martial allies, for instance. But as a 5th edition, a lot of those power differences have been smoothed over, and the game is largely designed around a party of the same level characters all working together. Thus, making the start over at level 1 rule obsolete outside of the most obscure circumstances. And on the same note... And at number 3, we have custom experience systems. Now, these aren't always so bad. There can be a lot of interesting and cool ways for a dungeon master to play with how the characters level up. Even if they level asymmetrically based on achieving certain goals or having certain divining character moments. A lot of role-playing games have this as a core mechanic, but as mentioned previously, D&D is largely balanced around a same-level party. Implementing old or new style rules that will inevitably lead to the characters drifting apart in levels requires a lot of extra bookkeeping for the players, as well as an entirely new dimension of encounter design balance for the dungeon master to worry about. Even something as simple as a single level difference can cause a cascade of effects that are unfair to certain players. One player having access to their second attack before another on a martial class can lead to the party putting all of their best gear onto that stronger player to maximize efficiency. After all, the magic sword is going to be a lot more effective in the hands of a level 5 paladin instead of the level 4 fighter. This can widen the already large gap in how effective the characters are in their primary roles. A better solution to wanting to mess with the level system in Dungeons & Dragons is to make sure that leveling up is tied to all characters so they level at the same time. Do you want the characters to level when they achieve an important personal goal? Well, make it so they only level when every member of the party has achieved a goal, so they're more likely to work together and help each other out. Or level them all up at the same time when one person achieves a big goal and categorize it as a group effort. There are good ways to do custom leveling and experience systems, but some of the worst house rules are the ones that split the players up in who gets to level and who doesn't. And it can become an even bigger problem if the dungeon master ends up playing favorites, dulling out more experience with the players and characters they like best. Any house rule that promotes favoritism is always questionable. And at number 2, we have Permanent Injuries. Permanent Injuries are a fairly common house rule meant to simulate what would really happen to a person if, say, a giant crocodile bit their leg but didn't kill them. It usually seeks to bypass the natural hidden mechanics of the game, not messing with hit points but imposing permanent downsides. Very commonly, these permanent injuries will be tied to certain mechanics triggering them, like a player losing half their hit points or more to a single attack or critical hit tables that come with permanent injuries. The latter is especially rough because players can't really avoid being hit with a critical roll every now and then. They already have to suffer increased damage, but a risk of some permanently debilitating injury is unfair because these will only really affect the players. Enemies don't tend to stick around long enough for permanent injury systems to affect them very much, but player characters are in the game for the long haul. Doubly so when the specific injuries can be catastrophic based on a class. A broken jaw might not be a big deal for Barbarian to suffer, but if it prevents the wizard from casting spells, suddenly they're useless. A crippled hand is something a spellcaster might be able to deal with, but the two-handed weapon using fighter is going to have to rethink their entire character to function properly for it. While these decisions on their own, in isolated incidents, can be interesting or worth exploring in a game, automating it to happen randomly and arbitrarily creates an unhealthy environment for the players. A more reasonable house rule to achieve the more positive aspects of permanent injuries is giving a player a permanent injury as a narrative consequence for a decision. This is a much stronger way to go about implementing this kind of obstacle for players rather than leaving it purely up to luck. And it lets you control it so it's not too unfair or arbitrary, so you can make sure the players are still able to have fun. Automating extra failure for players outside of the game's regular failure mechanics can make for some of the most unfun situations, which leads to the last house rule on this list. And at number one, we have critical fumbles. Critical fumbles are maybe the most common house rule in the game. They're designed to add a bit more spice to the player's worst rolls, emulating the highs of critical hit successes by giving an even bigger lower to a critical failure. Common critical fumbles include things like making players accidentally hit each other with their attacks, somehow bypassing each other's armor class when they catastrophically fail, or hurting their allies. Sometimes more extreme things like the player who rolled a natural one losing or even breaking their weapon. Or failure on a persuasion check that can turn a previously neutral or friendly NPC hostile escalating a situation just because the player was trying to engage in a social encounter. The problem with this kind of rule is that players are disproportionately affected by this compared to non-player characters. Much like the previously mentioned permanent injury table, players are inevitably going to roll ones throughout the course of a game and are going to have to survive with any critical fumble consequences for the foreseeable future. An enemy critically fumbling isn't that big of a deal. There's always new enemies around the corner. Increasing the likelihood of terrible outcomes in the game just means the player will end up suffering more negative outcomes, 
and are more likely to suffer a full team party kill or a completely failed objective for something entirely out of their control that isn't really a part of the game. Rolling a 1 is already bad enough. The majority of the time, it's already a failure, and a failure doesn't need a bigger downside. It's not like critical hits where a small increase in damage might be helpful, but damage variants already exist, and critical hit damage is already factored into the bounds of the game. The occasional narrative flair to add to the consequences of a failure is well within the bounds of the rules and can add a lot of spice to the game. But systematically making rolling ones an even more ruinous outcome just encourages players to not try to do anything that requires a roll, for fear of bigger consequences that they can't predict. Failure is an important part of the game, but you should try to avoid anything that might make the players averse to playing the game for fear of failure.